today I'm talking to Evelyn Ray. Uh, she is a political commentator, uh, but prior to becoming that, she used to work as a police officer, joining the Australian Police Force at 18 years of age and went on to attain the rank of detective. After 12 years of service, she then decided to leave the force and has gone on to become a to become known as a Christian conservative political commentator and writer for the Cauldron Pool. She's also a contributor to Sky News Australia and hosts her own YouTube channel, New South Wales One Nation TV. Hi Evelyn, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, uh, I first of all wanted to start off with your time in the police force. Um, I was wondering if you could please speak about your time there and your impression of police culture. Yeah, that's a very loaded question. There is, I feel like we could do a whole show just on this particular subject, but I'll try to keep it as brief um, and concise as possible. So, you know, you sort of said I joined the police when I was 18, um, pretty much straight from high school. And I, yeah, I worked really hard to sort of obtain the rank of detective. Um, and I worked in lots of different units. I only wore uniform for a couple of years. Um, and then pretty much after that point, I went into more organized crime. I did child sex crimes um, as a detective. I investigated things like that. So um, I was spared a lot of the cultural flaws um, within the police because I think most of that, majority of that, happens in your LACs, which is your local area commands, like your police stations in uniform. Uh, when you branch off into more specialised areas of policing, there are fewer people there. I worked in a unit of, in the child sex crimes in my particular unit, there was like six detectives, that was it. Um, in the organised crime ones, there was like 20 uh, so you're working in a smaller group of people. It's very niche policing, very covert, very specialized. So I I feel very grateful I was spared for for a lot of the cultural issues. But there there are many many cultural issues within the police, and I think um, the last few years has kind of highlighted to the public many of those flaws which is a lack of accountability with the police which is a lack of training and a lack of uh, critical thinking amongst officers and the culture that's sort of bred within the police is unfortunately one that ostracizes police officers who can think for themselves and ostracizes police officers who dare question the hierarchy um, and yeah, we're sort of seeing the the bad end of that over COVID and the sort of pandemic. Mm. Um, yeah, I know. I, you know, I realize by nature, you know, people who join the police are usually very law and order, law abiding, follow the rules type of personality types, but. Um, yeah, during the COVID, I suppose, protests and stuff, we did see a bit of an ugly side come out. Is, mm -hmm. Do you think that was more of a recent development as opposed to when you were working on the force? Definitely not. It's all by design. Um, without sounding too much of a conspiracy theorist, the <laughs> truth of it is they've been recruiting quota over quality for decades. There are many people who would probably be very well suited for the role of law enforcement um, who have missed out on the opportunity because they didn't suit the status quo, the, the, quote, the current quota. Um, you know, there are so many females who are joining the police at an exponential rate to men, often getting selected before a man uh, purely because of their gender um, and you know I, I, I'm not saying females shouldn't be police officers I'm obviously one of them 
but I'm happy to admit I was probably a quota uh, recruitment. I was a young 18 year old impressionable girl who probably ticked all of the boxes and I got in. Thank goodness <laughs> I managed to get in and I hope that um, my years of service show that I wasn't the quota. I actually did do a pretty good job. Um, and I think my, I guess my resume in the police is probably a reflection of that. However, um, it's definitely not something that's happened over the last few years. It's been by design for quite a while. Unfortunately, I think it's just happened at a far more rapid rate over the recent years as woke politics and culture have kind of implement, infested, sorry, our uh, impartial systems like law enforcement. Um, it, it happens across the board. I, I know family members who have been trying to get into the fire brigade, into paramedics, into all these things for a really long time, but there are you know, a straight white male and unfortunately haven't been able to get in. Um, but if they had have ticked those quota boxes, I'm sure they would have. But yeah, the, unfortunately, um, there's going to be, there's going to require a, a big reformation within these organisations if we're ever going to see change because it's been happening for a really, really long time. It's just never really been tested to the extent that it has been throughout COVID. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that you mentioned, you know, your age of being young and impressionable and during mm. your early days of joining. Um, I had a friend, I won't say the name, but um, I he was a young man, about early 20s at the time when I first met him. He did end up joining the police force. Uh, I, I met him at uni, we were doing international relations at the time, and, uh, and he was very, really sweet personality, he always greeted me with, you know, a hug, um, very, uh, very into very deep conversations and reflections, and, you know, he was a thinker, uh, and, you know, we did keep in touch uh, after he joined, but I did notice um, he, he loved his job, but we're talking to the point of going into work on his days off. You know, he had mm -hmm. holiday time and he still went to work. Um, mm -hmm. he, I, I, I understand of being a young man and you're, and you're, and you're passionate about your job and, and things like that. And I remember speaking to him going, well, you have to be careful because you can end up getting a bit of a, uh, a a bit of a cult mentality going on if you just go to work and you just have friends that are basically police officers or things like that and then mm. you'll end up just thinking in a certain way and and that's it and i remember warning him about that and then later on we were talking about other things like politics and stuff like that and the, and the COVID situation. And it was around the time when the first protests started to happen in Sydney. And um, I noticed he went straight for the uh, downplaying any real bad police actions, uh, concentrated on the people that did get out of hand. Um, and, and yeah, I, I noticed that side of things creeping in. I'm going, well, okay, you arrest the people that got violent or out of hand, but you don't condemn the protesting. Um, and also I noticed uh, other things like uh, we're talking about Trump and he was like, oh, Daniel, there's nothing you can say to me to convince me that he's not, not a racist. And so I noticed he went from being an open-minded type of thinker and reflecting and contemplating things into more of a, I've made up my mind, you can't change my thinking. And I noticed since then, uh, we basically lost, <laughs> we lost touch. Uh, uh, he used mm -hmm. to be, you know, ringing me up and asking me questions about what's happening in the world and things like that. And I've noticed with the recent developments, he, uh, instead of, expecting a call or talking to him about it, he's kind of went his own way, he kind of went silent. 
So mm -hmm. um, looking at that story, uh, do you see that happening a lot now with, with the younger recruit? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, concept. I, th I think it isn't just reserved to police officers and oh, those no, no, particular organisations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, it comes down to the old Bible verse where it says, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. And it's a pretty helpful thing to sort of live by because whoever you're spending your time with, you essentially become like them. You become like the people you hang around. And the the way that the cop culture works and why you can maybe see this more in police culture than other areas is because it is a really difficult um, line of work to separate from your personal life because the way that I sort of saw it is it's like this morality, this com sorry, this camaraderie um, that you build. It's similar to, you know, men who go off to war together. They come back and they feel a sense of belonging to one another because they've experienced the same things. They've been through the same things. And there is a sense of feeling that no one else can understand how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've seen some of the worst things imaginable. Like there, like people in my my life, my family, would just have absolutely no idea the depths of evil that I've had to witness with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that you feel like you don't want to burden people in your home life with because who wants to hear about old babies being murdered by their father? Who wants to hear about? some of the sexual acts that people are doing to two-year-olds who wants to hear about um you know junkies injecting their babies on the street with heroin to stop them from crying who wants to hear about these heinous crimes like you don't want to burden people that you love and you cherish that you come home to with these horrible monstrosities so you do feel like the only people in your life who understand it are those who have experienced it with you so mm -hmm. there is that bond and there is that camaraderie and there is a trap that people fall into where they their identity becomes their career or their their, their job and, and that's another element that plays into policing because I, I do feel like there are two types of people who are drawn to law enforcement one you've got people who genuinely want to do good who genuinely have a passion for justice and for, you know, helping and keeping communities safe. And two, you've got people who enjoy the costume of law enforcement. You've got people who enjoy the, um, the badge and all the authority that comes with that. And unfortunately, two different extremes, but there's obviously... I would suggest a, most people who join think that they want to do it for good reasons, but there, there's increasingly over the years, a lot of police officers who are joining in the second option who just like the badge and the authority. But what, what happens with that is the identity comes through that career. And because of those two personality types, they're, they're so entwined with that particular job. It, it's all they can identify themselves through and with. And so the combination of the trauma of what you see, plus the personality types of the people who are probably joining law enforcement, it's kind of a recipe for withdrawing from society and putting all your eggs essentially in one basket. And mm. I think that um, I was really fortunate in that my father served in the capacity. He wasn't in law enforcement, but he was in emergency services um, for over 30 years. He still does it today. Um, and he's quite high up in emergency services. So similar type of cultural um, fractures and restraints. And so when I said that I wanted to join law enforcement, he sat me down and he went through this really thoroughly and said, you have to go to work and come home uh, and Mr. leave Sorry, everything. Ava, uh, you're, we're fading out a bit. Can you repeat that, please? 
Oh, sorry. I was, I was just saying that um, I'm not sure what you heard, but my father sat me down when I was young. He sat me down and really sort of put it in me that I needed to go to work and then clock off and come home and leave everything at work. And he actually said to me, do not be friends with the people that you work with. They're your work friends, but as soon as that shift's finished, you keep your your childhood friends. You keep your friends from church. Keep everything in your life precious and put all your efforts into that. And then he had a friend of his who used to be a police officer who then went into the area that my dad works, who he actually, they kind of had a family intervention and I came home one day and my dad and his colleague were sitting there, these two men that I respected, and sat me down and spoke to me about how I should behave in the police force and how I needed to really make sure I don't get caught up in the culture. And, you know, I did 12 years. Um, and when I resigned, I didn't have anyone up with me. No one's like checking in on me. How are you going, Evelyn? How's, how, you know, since you left the police? And I was a bit upset about it because I thought I've given 12 years to this particular organization. I've bled with these people for 12 years. I've, you know, where I, I've had a colleague shot <laughs> and killed and I've done, experienced that with these colleagues and then I resign and they have nothing to do with me. And I used to get really upset about it, but I'm starting to realize that it's actually exactly how I wanted it to be, which was I go to work, I do my job, I do it well, and I go home and I have my life at home. And I think when I resign and the fact that I haven't kept in touch really with many police officers is probably testament to the fact that I didn't get caught up in the culture and that me leaving wasn't really a big deal to these people personally because uh I, you know i didn't have that kind of bond that way with them so i'm grateful as an 18 year old that my father kind of really um shaped the way that i was going to be throughout my career mm -hmm. yeah funny that you mentioned that because i remember saying to my friend um you know um make sure you have friends that are not police officers and I did say to him, remember, you are a person that joined the police. You are not mm. a police officer. <laughs> like, it's the other way around. Like, like you are not your job. Yeah. You are a person. Um, but I don't know. I think he may be. Unfortunately, he may have gone that way. Um, it's very common. It happened. I saw it all the time. It's, it's in, I'll just quickly say this. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. But no, no, no. I had, over the years, so many people in my personal life reach out to me and say, Evelyn, I'm thinking about joining the police. Can you help me? And the first thing I would say would be, don't do it. Right. Don't do it. And these were like Christian men who had wives and children. I said, just don't do it, mate. Just, this is my advice. Uh, don't do it. The culture is just rotten and there is so much adultery there is so much corruption within like and i just was so fearful if i wasn't honest with these people i cared about that they might get trapped in like what you said your friend might be going through and i i saw so many husbands and wives divorce because one of them has gone into the police force and then they change you see people change. I saw that over the years. I've seen a wife who has children with her husband. He was a police officer. She wasn't. And they had a, it was fine. Everything was great. But then she decided to join the police. So that means two parents were now going to be police officers. Mm -hmm. And the whole family is now split up and having all these troubles. And I, and I foresaw it. And I said to my friend, I said, I told you do it and do not let your wife do it it will ruin your family and unfortunately it just does that and um there was one person over the years that I said would be a fantastic police officer 
and they're the only person I encouraged to do it. They weren't married. They didn't have children and they weren't, they was, they were a person who could critically and independently think and not easily swayed. And they have been fantastic, but I've had dozens of people and I've every other part from that one, I've said, don't do it. Don't do it. I've had nieces and nephews in my family and, you know, relatives sort of say, I want to be like you, Auntie Evelyn. I want to do this. And I'm like, no, you will never do what <laughs> Auntie Evelyn has done. No, it's, I, I joined the 2007 era. So it, it was bad then, but it's only gotten worse over the years. And I managed to survive because I had a really strong father who kind of led me pretty well in those early years. But it, I wasn't perfect in those 12 years. I had to take a lot of sacrifices in my personal life. And um, I would never wish any of that on anyone that I love or care about. So I'll mm -hmm. let you go, but it's very common. People join and then they change. And I've seen it so often over the years with so many people. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, I suppose it's, you know, no different from politics or, uh, or you know, sport or whatever you get into a certain group or certain culture you change with it and then you end up not becoming the same person you were when you started exactly uh, yeah um okay well m moving on to more of the political side of things um now that you've become known as a political commentator uh were you always political or <clears throat> excuse me were you always political or were you like that when you were in the force or did that come later? And how would, how did you end up becoming into politics? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I would say, no, I haven't always been political. I grew up with parents who are very conservative in their values and their morals, a Christian family. So I've always sort of grown up, I guess, knowing the truth of things, not having a, what I believe to be a pretty rational understanding of morality of what's right and what's wrong. Um, but I remained very quiet in the police. So I people would be talking about all kinds of things and I just wouldn't offer my opinion. I just kept quiet. And I think that's the way my dad sort of trained me to sort of be go to work, <laughs> talk about work, come home. And so I kind of was always like that, but I, I noticed um, towards the tail end of my career coming up into 2000 and I'd say 14 onwards, um, when I sort of was more political I, or more aware of things because the world kind of was increasingly and at a higher rate becoming more corrupt, it, it was harder to just keep quiet, especially in the office when people were talking about you know, the same sex marriage debate that was in 2017. Um, and, you know, a few things like that. It was becoming increasingly harder to sort of sit back and um, kind of not say anything at all. But then I, I really did keep quiet. Um, but in 2017, when the same sex marriage plebiscite came up in Australia, I started to write under a pseudonym, under um, a pen name called Girl Rising Above the Noise. And I started to write about a lot of the, I guess what I believe to be the ripple effect of this same sex marriage debate would be. Um, and I used a lot of parallels with Canada because Canada kind of were at the forefront of this movement. And there, were, there was a case where a four-year-old court of law um his parents had to by law because of this court order confirm his transgender transition from boy to girl whatever it was mm -hmm. um and so i could kind of see i guess where the root of the evil was the redefining of gender the redefining of marriage between a man and a woman i and Again, in the police, there's most women, well, I'd say a lot of women are lesbians. Um, and, you know, I worked with them fine. I never treated them any differently. And I, I still respect them as human beings like I would anybody else. 
but um, it was something I felt quite passionate about because mostly I could I was worried about our children in schools, the curriculum changes that would come with it, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess those things is probably the catalyst for what started getting me to talk about things politically. But I was bound by um, uh, police sort of protocols where I wasn't able to speak out publicly with opinions on politics because I was still employed by the police. So that's why I chose to write under a pen name. And I sort of started writing articles and things um, from then. If something interested me or I felt particularly passionate about it, then yeah, 2020 came around when the official resignation came through. And that's when I came out with my name at that point and um, sort of put everything on the line and thought, here we go. I can do it now lawfully and I'm just going to do it um, and go for it. And yeah, definitely the same sex marriage debate was the catalyst, was the, what got me more publicly vocal about politics and about things. But yeah, as I said, I've always raised in quite a traditional home and quite a, a conservative home. So I've always had these thoughts and opinions. I've always kind of been this way inclined, but I would say I was a lot softer, quieter just sat in the background without speaking much about it until sort of later on in my life. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, going on from that, well, how, how would you classify or identify yourself as politically exactly? For example, um, Christian, traditional, conservative, um, I noticed you do host One Nation TV. I, I mean, are you a member of One Nation or you are basically associate with them or, or what? I mean, who are you politically? Yeah, I, so I'm not a member of any political party. So I'm not a member of One Nation um, and I'm not a member of any of these other recent sort of alternative um, political parties at all. I was approached by One Nation um, to see if I could ho just host their TV, sh their TV program. I think they wanted somebody in the political space that I guess uh, wasn't, I guess, um, associated with any political parties. I think they wanted someone fairly independent and they wanted someone fairly impartial to um, sort of do that. Um, so when they sort of approached me, I, I was initially hesitant because I am not associated or a member of any political party. So I kind of was a bit, didn't really know what to do, but I sort of prayed about it and thought about it. And, um, and, and I was quite, I, I sort of came to the decision that I was comfortable to host their show. And I'm happy to promote, um, you know, some of the things that they do, to be honest, um, I, I haven't voted for any of the major political parties in, in quite a while. Um, I, I voted um, with like independence and, and things like that uh, well before it became fashionable to do so. Um, I don't know what, what I'm going to do in the next election. I wish I knew, to be honest. I like the long history of One Nation, that we know where they stand. I mean, Pauline Hanson's been doing this for 30 years. She's been pretty consistent. There are, what worries me about some of the newer political parties is um, that they're new, that I don't know their history or who they are. And mm -hmm. I might agree with them on COVID policy, but what are they going to say about um, late-term abortion? What are they going to say about euthanasia? What are they going to say about um, safe schools being brought into the curriculum? I don't know. Um, and, you know, what are they going, if, if it ever comes up, like, again, not what's already been done, but hypothetically, if there was a same-sex marriage debate, where, where do people stand on that? And so what worries me about a lot of the political parties that are coming out is I just don't know the answer to these questions. None of us do because they're only fairly new. I do like the fact that I can look at One Nation and look back on them for, for quite a while and see how, their consistency on things. Um, but I am not a member of One Nation. 
um, and I'm not a member of any other political party and I'm still, I still don't know what I'm going to do in this upcoming election. To be fair and to be completely transparent, One Nation will definitely be probably getting a vote from me um, as well as the other independent um, sort of newer um, political parties. I don't know what order of preference I'm going to put any of those in, but I certainly won't be voting for any of the major political parties, Labor, Liberal, Greens, Nationals. It's just not going to happen. So... Mm -hmm. That's sort of where I sit politically. If the Australian Christian Party, uh, when Corey Bernardi was there, was still in, that I would probably be voting for him. Mm -hmm. I was a bit disappointed to see him go. Um, I thought I, I feel like he left at the wrong time. I feel like if he if they if that political party was still in right now, they'd be doing pretty well for themselves. So I, I'm not sure if that was a lack of discernment or it was just I'm not sure to be honest, but. Um, right for a change in this country with with our politics um but if you want to talk about labels with where i sit um i'm a christian first and foremost i will not separate my theology from my vote people want me to people want me to separate church and state i'm sorry but i'm a christian the morality that i get is from from Understanding of the Bible from what God tells me, um, there is no way. It's like separating the oxygen out of the air. I just can't do it. Um, and so it's my faith that determines what I believe is right and wrong. And that's how I determine my vote. So I can't, I would say I'm a Christian. Um, I would say that I am most certainly economically conservative. I like little government. I think um, small government is best. And I would also say I'm socially conservative as well. I think there are a lot of conservatives who are economically conservative, but are more libertarian when it comes to social matters. I am certainly not in that category. I'm very much not a libertarian. I am definitely economically and socially conservative, but all of those things would stem from my faith as a woman of God. So I, I don't really know what you would label me Christian conservative. I don't know. I don't know what the right term is. Um, yeah, it's getting pretty hard to yeah. even for myself to uh, label myself. I mean, I think the overtick window has shifted so far left that um, I think everyone uh, left and right are basically uncertain anymore of how to label themselves. Uh, but yeah, um, I think this is where we're going to have a bit of trouble moving forward. And I'll explain why. It's this big tent policy. I mean, we saw it in America with the election with Trump and Biden. We saw that like everybody came together um, to either vote red or to either vote blue. When you look at the Republican Party voting for that, within that umbrella, there are many different types of people. Um, that would fall under the same umbrella of Republican, would fall under the same umbrella of that right spectrum. But when you go underneath the umbrella and you look at all the different branches that hold it up, you do have libertarians, you do have conservatives, you do have um, religious people of all different types who, who all came together to vote one way however on an ideological level they couldn't be more opposite or more different and I think that's what we're going to find here in Australia is we've never really needed or required to be tested like we have over the last few years and what that has seen is us all kind of come together in one big tent in one under one umbrella and that's people who is anti-government corruption we, don't, we want to end the mandates. We want to end the lockdowns. We want the government to basically step out and stop telling us what to do with our kids, particularly vaccines. And we've all kind of come together, which has been a really nice thing and it's encouraging. But what I think we're going to find when we move out of this COVID period and we move forward, we're, very, we're going to be very different on an ideological level 
example, there are many people who have probably come to my page, who have probably found out who I am because of my stance on COVID. But no one's really asked me what my stance on abortion is. No one's really asked me what my stance on, on euthanasia is. And what we'll find is we're going to find the pointy end of this with our politics, with um, our ideologies, because we all came together, as I said, but I mean, there are probably a lot of people who follow me who are totally fine with abortion and I'm not. And right. I think that's, that's, a, that's what we're going to see from this one tent, one umbrella type thing of politics in Australia. It's all well and good. We've come together. Hopefully we can conquer the enemy, but once the enemy is conquered and then we have to figure out how we're going to run this country and what ideological standards we're going to have to run this country. We're going to, I feel like, really be kind of figuring out who actually is more like us and who isn't. Um, right. So I'm interested to see where this goes. Because there are lots of people I respect and lots of people that I have, I really uh, think have done a wonderful job during COVID, but I would probably never vote for them because they think completely differently to me on late-term abortion. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Well well, half to admit, you're kind of preaching, <laughs> preaching to the choir. That's kind of my own analysis uh, as well. Um, I really think, yeah, as you said, I think all the, um, I suppose, the so-called freedom parties of my nation, Liberal Democrats and UIP and all the other independent types, I think it's really like more of a, an alliance and a marriage of convenience because we mm. have a common enemy. But then afterwards, um, we're going to have to start splitting up again and start mm. jockeying for position once again. But um, but going on to what you said with uh, the big tent, yeah, I, I noticed that in as you said in, in America, we've got the Republicans. There's uh, so many different subgroups, you know, neocons, uh, establishment types, uh, libertarians, and etc. Um, and I noticed that in Australia too, especially with the Liberal Party. Um, I noticed there's like the Abbott conservative type uh, wing, and then you have the more wet um, Turnbull um, type of Liberal as well. And they're usually mm -hmm. jockeying for position within their own party. So if you, I'm not a Liberal, person um but um if you're a liberal voter and you want to vote liberal party but you're pro abbott for example um you vote liberal but you're not going to get Abbott. you're going to get turnbull you know for example yeah. uh yeah. so so your vote you're voting for a party that doesn't really uh, reflect your values um but at the same time you don't want to vote for labor or the greens so where, you, where, yeah. where are you going to go? That's why I really am in favor of a multi-party system. I mean, um, you have, your vote will be more, you will count more. Like, for example, if you're a conservative and you had the, uh, you had Bernardi's party around, vote conservative. If you're a leftist, vote Green, vote Labour, vote, you, you know, it'll be more defined and more real as opposed to what we have now where you're voting, but they're not really your party, but you vote anyway and, you know, close enough. And and I think the biggest problem is, is the two major parties, they're basically on the issues that matter. They're basically mirror images of each other. I mean, uh, look at the COVID strategy of the both pro lockdown, pro, <coughs> excuse me, uh, pro mandate, pro everything else, pro war, pro um, uh, pro economic strategies. Uh, they might, you know, quibble on I don't know safety nets and tax rates and X Y Z, but um, we really there is no real choice anymore. Um, I think it's been that for a long time, and I think only now Australians particularly. Uh, only now really starting to wake up to that fact. I think for a long time, Australia's been very much pacified, very easygoing, too easygoing. 
and you know go along to get along don't rock the boat be nice um and that's even reflected with the whole covid situation i don't know how many people were pro um authority or pro if not authoritarian authoritarianism i mean we have camps in australia now you know there were people actually i mean i overheard them in conversation uh almost wanting to be people to be forced to take the vaccines like mandate like, like physically go get injected uh um and i think this period of time i really show the reflection to a strange that they don't want to really admit and maybe they're not as nice not as easygoing as they always like to think of themselves to be uh do you agree with that or i think for a long time yeah in australia with our political system it's always no one's won a vote no one's actually gone out and won the hearts and minds of the people for a vote. It's always been they've won by default based on the lesser of two evils. So, and I've been guilty of this. I go, I don't want Labor to get in. I'll vote Liberal because even though Liberal I don't like or agree with, I would rather that than the Labor Party. And I think for a really long time, that's unfortunately how our politics have worked. We haven't really had any option other than Labor or Liberal. And Greens is just an offshoot of Labor. It has been for a long time. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of been it. It's only now we're seeing this new era of alternative political parties. But, I, you know, a lot of people, I, I still don't know if Australia is ready for that. I'm not sure if Australia is at the point where they can break the ties between or the tether between these two major political parties because we've almost been indoctrinated into it. Um, you know, like my, my nan, for example, she's in her late 90s. She will vote Liberal till the day she dies. It's not, mm. and, and that's just because of what she's done her whole life. Um, and I think that's been a generational thing. I mean, if you look up statistics, there have been studies done that say young women and men, they generally vote what their dads do. Mm -hmm. I grew up with my father being conservative and being um, a liberal voter because there wasn't, well, he actually used to like um, the Australian Christian Party. But, you know, I sort of tended to le lean that way in my politics because of my father's sort of influence. And and unfortunately, that generation, like my, my dad, late 50s, early 60s, that boomer generation, I don't think that they're quite ready to break free from that. And so we're still getting other generations who are trapped in this never ending cycle of you can only vote Labour or Liberal. And so I'm curious to see what's going to happen in the next election because of COVID. I'm like, is this going to help these alternative political parties or is this going to just show us that we're so broken as a nation, we can't break out of habits? Because culturally speaking, as a nation, Australia has always valued security over freedom. You look at America, for example, they're a beacon of freedom. They fought for their independence. They fought for their freedom on a constitutional level and even embedded in their federalist papers. The men and women that create, well, it was men, that created that country did it on the basis of understanding what freedom is and the value of freedom over anything else. Whereas Australia, we were a convict nation. We broke, we came over here as part of the monarch and everything that we were given here was given to us by the government from day dot because we were convicts. This was our second chance. This was a place where we were coming. And so the government became our gods. The government became our parents. The government became our security. So it's like a generational curse. We've, we've kind of built the foundations of our entire country on the, on the false narrative that the government will provide everything we need. And so we have bred into our kids and their kids and their kids this need for security or short-term comforts. And I think that we're going to really see in this new election whether we're going to break that curse or whether we're so far gone that I don't, if this, if COVID doesn't break us, I just don't know what will, what will break this curse because I just don't know. I feel like we value security way too much and 
what I really try to say and suggest with my political commentary is, and I try to say to people, you might value your short-term comforts now, but you're going to want and need your long-term freedoms. That's something that you need, uh, your basic human rights. And just don't seem to get it. And, you know, if you you choose security over freedom in the end you're going to end up with neither of those things you'll end up with neither security or freedom and it's a one-way ticket to communism to socialism and you only have to look at a history book to see how that ends and people say oh it's never been tested properly yeah i'm sorry that's a load of nonsense (laughs) it has and it fails every single time because it fails anything that goes against your basic fundamental human rights the rights that was bestowed upon us by the grace of god by us being made in his image anything that goes against those things is a is a disaster waiting to happen you can't go against god's inherited purpose and what he's intended for us and expect it to go well and so this next election will be really interesting because i i just i'm losing faith that our country is ever going to get out of this mess. Well, uh, once again, it's like talking to myself. Um, uh, I, I basically can hear yeah, the very same conclusions and, and, and worries because um, as you said, I think it's fundamental hardwired into the Australian psyche due to our experience and our founding. I mean, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, uh america had a revolution they fought for what they wanted they they had to establish who they are they it was it's completely different foundations to the australian experience of basically here you go australia here's your system here's your government here's your values don't worry your pretty little head just be good colonialists and if you're good enough, you you may be um, invited back into polite society, society again. Yeah. And I think um, that's still even with us today. I mean, even the whole idea of of more of a, a, more of a independent foreign policy, or a or to become a republic, or or any form of autonomy or, or, or sovereignty. Um, we kind of shy away from it. I mean, I remember I was I was volunteering at a radio station at one st- one point, and something about Brexit was on the TV, and uh, you know, and the people I was surrounded with, they were like they couldn't get they couldn't compute why would Britain want to leave the European Union? Uh, mm-hmm. Like the whole idea of independence uh, is it seems to be a foreign concept um and yeah Yeah. and i and i think uh it's reflected with the whole idea of obeying the government and buying the mandates and buying the restrictions and um and as you said i am although it's good to see the protests and good to see the freedom parties kind of get a surge of support i i'm a little bit worried Is is it more of a echo chamber is the majority of Australians just going to vote Labour because I hate Morrison mm. and then even though Labour is all for all for the same things the Liberals were um but in fact they're okay with the mandates they're okay with the camps they okay it's it's you and me and people like us that are out of step um mm. that's why I'm kind of really uh highly seriously considering um maybe eventually that's relocating or we'll, we'll see somewhere um mm. it's hard to do that because this is a global situation it's happening everywhere so where do you go um mm. maybe well, maybe florida and <laughs> maybe texas um <laughs> but other than that um <sighs> You know, it's not like it used to be like this Cold War where it was clearly defined two different systems, you know, know, and you can go to America, for example, or the West. Um, Now it's everywhere. It's in Europe. It's in Australia. It's in America. It's in Britain. It's 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 everywhere. Although I have to say, 
Australia and Canada seem to be more draconian than even Britain. I mean, for example, mm. Britain has got rid of all the restrictions. And Australia and uh, Canada, this, uh, I think, I, actually, I think Canada kind of lifted some of them too now. Uh, but Australia is still holding on. It still doesn't want to let go of those restrictions. I mean, for example, mm. the mandates for work is still on. Um, that's, that's affected me personally. I haven't worked since October. I don't know how many jobs I was denied or was basically said, oh, we can't go any further with your application as soon as I as soon as I heard that I wasn't vaxxed mm -hmm. I mean uh, uh, so you know I'm looking at uh, unless things change with the next election we can get a foothold into the uh, government and maybe we can change some things uh, I am seriously have to consider going somewhere else because I can't waste another year just sitting around the house um, you know, hopefully maybe getting lucky and finding a job that doesn't really want the mandate. Um, mm. so, um, yeah, it's, unfortunate. it's worrying because, um, like I said, uh, are the, are the majority trained okay with it? And I'm the one that's out of place. I don't know. I think, um, I, I actually do think there's almost like there's three types of Australians. One, you've got the group of Australians who are more than happy to go along with the mandates, the lockdowns. They're basically the govern me harder daddy types. And yeah. they're all for the Jane Caro, Caro, have you pronounced the name? Those sorts of types of Australians um, who have like the, the blue um, teardrop in their bio, all for climate change. You've got those type of Australians who I don't think are the majority but I think they're on, uh, they're, there's, a, there's a decent number of them. And then you've got the types of Australians like you and I who are viewed as the extreme, who are, um, are completely against government involvement in our personal health in terms of like mandating vaccines and things. You've got people who are like us who are very pro-freedom, anti-government, you've got that. And then I think the bulk of Australians, which would be the majority, are the types who probably don't agree with the mandates, probably don't agree with the lockdowns, but will just go along with it because they're either not ready to stand and have to give up their short-term comforts or they just don't care enough and they just want to just do what, that, what, the right, what they're being told is the right thing. And so what we have to do, I think those of us in our sort of spectrum who are very much awake to the agenda, our job is to lead the majority to water and hope and pray to God that they take a drink because we can lead a horse to water, but we can't force them to drink. Mm. I don't think us kicking and screaming and, and, and protesting is really going to make any difference to that majority of Australians who just don't really know they're kind of on the fence. I think the only benefit that comes from protesting is the community feeling and it makes people feel less alone. If people feel like they're standing alone in a political thought or, an, or a political movement, they're not going to be as loud. Whereas mm. if people feel like they're not alone, there is that mob mentality feel. Not all mob mentalities are bad. There is very bad mob mentality, but there's also a positive mob mentality. And there is that, um, I guess, mentality of a crowd and what can come from a crowd. And, and there's actually been psychological reports um, that have been made. There was a French man in the 1800s who actually wrote about it. And he, he wrote about the psychology of a crowd. And he mm -hmm. spoke about how people in a crowd are more likely to do things that they wouldn't do if they were on their own. If they were one person at a shopping center and they saw something and they were by themselves, they might not step in and do something. But if there's people around them who are like-minded to them, they're more likely to step in and do something. And this particular guy in the 1800s who wrote about the psychology of the crowd goes into that in great detail. So there is benefit to protest. There is benefit to not feeling alone, but it certainly is not likely to make any difference in, in the short term. 
the 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 protests the the crowds i believe personally is more of a long term thing getting more people to feel not alone getting more people to be confident to stand up for what is right getting more people to feel like they have a community around them who will support them if you know and, and that's if there's a benefit from that but in terms of short term politics we really need more of a grassroots type movement where we somehow lead that majority of quiet Australians to that watering hole. And then we need to stand around the watering hole and try and convince them to take a drink. That's all we can really do on the political front. But even more so to, to, to any of this, the only real thing and hope that Australians have is we our homes. And I've said this uh, so sorry, could you that. repeat that, please? You faded out a bit. Sorry, yeah. The only real hope we have, and this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. This is a real long-term thing. The only real hope we have for Australians is what we do within the four walls of our own home. So we have a responsibility as Australians who are in our sort of category, that third category, that more extreme they would probably like to label us, but that awake to the truth mm. the people. Our job is to protect the four walls of our homes at all costs. Our job is to raise the next generation in the truth. Our job is to raise the next generation to understand how to use logic and reason and objectivity and debate. We need to raise the next kids to... Um, understand that the government are not our gods. We need the next generation to understand that the government are not mum and dad because while ever we treat them like mum and dad, they're going to treat us like their children. And we need to break that generational thing in the next kids. And it, it's going to be a long, a slow burn doing this, but it's the only real hope we have. Um, with a majority can make a tangible difference until then we've got to do the hard work majority um and lots of people have different ideas of solutions lots of people have different things but it's, it's it, to me it's pretty basic we've got to raise our kids better we've got to create a culture that is better i think we really have to raise our families our kids and ourselves as individuals away from the government to be as self-reliant as possible so that when the government wants to do all these draconian tyrannical things it won't affect us as individuals as much and we can make more of a stand we're not worried about the roof of our home being taken away and our kids being on the street because we've set up our life in such a way we're not dependent on government handout you know we, we start to grow our own food and veggies so if and I pray this never happens, if they ever decide to ration food because of whatever pandemic, it doesn't affect our life as much because we're eating better. We're learning to do things ourselves. We need to turn off mainstream media. I really think we need to have people on our side creating content for kids, different cartoons for kids, music, TV shows. We need to have all these different things available to us and to our community so we can survive as we're going through this big, um, I guess, time period of revival. Because it's a, As I said, it's a long burn and we've got to do things in the short term to make us survive. But what we need to do while we're surviving is raise our kids better. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, um, from what you just said, it did remind me, I don't know if you ever saw it, there's a interview by Yuri Bismanov. Have you ever heard of him? I think so, no. No, he was a KGB defector. And he, actually, I have the whole interview. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah, that now. No. yeah, it's an old video, isn't it? Yeah, from the 80s. Uh, I got the whole interview yeah. on my website. But um, yeah, yeah, and I remember clearly he was saying um, it takes 25 years to basically corrupt a uh, uh, a, a society. Uh, why 25 years? Because that's the generation. Once you get 
one generation kind of broken, it becomes self perpetual. And then eventually you don't need to be, you don't even need to do the brainwashing or you just, people kind of do it themselves. And they raise the next generation in a different way compared to the previous one. And in a way, I think, um, and I think that's kind of happened with the, I suppose, the globalist type of people. Uh, they've kind of went the cultural route. I mean, I think they really went Gramsci. They, they, mm. they, um, they understood that the economic and the revolutionary and all that stuff didn't work. So they, they played the long game to their credit, actually. They took over the institutions. They went for the academia. They went for the uh, entertainment industry, the singing, the TV shows, the movies, the everything else, the values of Hollywood, the celebrity. Um, they, they, they went uh, completely that way. And it, I think it worked, uh, mm. uh, at least to a certain degree. I think it really made two hats to them, hats off to them, really. Um, and I think, in a way, we would have to kind of ironically <laughs> ironically adopt Gramsci ourselves and kind of go yeah and, and kind of go take the take the cultural fight and like go for said, Rambo <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah um I, I mean um uh I, I mean we have like you said we have to take our own comedy uh type of comedians we follow the 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 children books cartoons and, and basically push back on the cultural front. I think for too long, the anti-globalist side were either sleeping at the wheel or not really, not believing just how bad the intentions actually were of these types, kind of thinking, oh, you'll never get, never get that bad. Don't worry about it. You're exaggerating. You're being paranoid. Um, and then um, I think they've, uh only now they tend to wake up to it and also i think on the other side i think we just had like i think a bit of snobbery to the culture side of things like oh where where we do um lectures and we do you know we talk about important things and we don't bother ourselves with the with the riffraff and no that that made us into a minority and now we've got such a uphill fight against us now. And mm. like you said, uh, culture dictates the <clears throat> politics. I think other, I think a lot of people have the other way around going, oh, if we can get the right person in or the right party, uh, they can turn it all around. And mm. not really, I mean, yes, eventually, but and yeah, do, do what you can in the meantime. But as you said, it's a long-term game. Uh, mm -hmm. You change the individual, you change the, the, the household, you change the community, you change the culture of society, that would eventually be reflected in the politics. And mm -hmm. people who would have such uh, such policies, uh, you know, uh, globalist policies, they won't find traction. Like people, mm -hmm. the minority, majority of people would not be voting for them. Um, but like you said, uh, it's a long term game. And um, I think we, we like, as you said, we really have to um, look at look at basically a, a, an alternative society, really, at least in the short term. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, it, it, it's, it's worrying too, because you don't want parallel societies either. Uh, but if the other side basically hates you, um what can you do you you basically have to you'll naturally gravitate to people who think the same way as you i think there's times in our life where you know it's ideal like we'd like to thrive and a thriving community is always best but there are certainly times where we just need to survive not necessarily mm -hmm. thrive and at the moment i think we're at that crossroads where those of us who are being segregated and discriminated against we just have to survive and so yeah it's as you said it's not ideal to have parallel societies but right now that's exactly where i want to be because i don't want to be around people who want me dead because i chose not to get a vaccination i don't want people around me who will take my child off me or you know you know parents in the, in these positions i don't want people like that around me who could take my child off me because i choose not to get them vaccinated so I would, I'm at this point in time, I need to survive 
our families need to survive. And if that means we deliberately segregate ourselves from society and have these parallel ones for the short term, that's probably what we need to do, unfortunately. But I do, I do think that um, uh, our culture at the moment is certainly determining our politics. Our politicians, if, if we look at the textbook, like what they're supposed to do, they're supposed to represent the people, but they don't. They, they represent these globalist uh, agendas. That's what they represent. They don't represent everyday Australians, that's for sure. Um, they represent the small echo chamber in Australia who are echoing these globalist ideas who do, you know, fall under suit for all those things. But everyday politicians and stuff, they, they wouldn't know what the people around them actually want or need. No one's asking. You have a number of politicians, a few of them, who are trying to do the right thing, but they're just completely ostracised and, mm. you know, dragged through the mud by the mainstream media. Um, you've got some fantastic ones. You've got Alec Antic. Mm. You've got Pauline Hanson, Mark Latham. You've got, um, oh, what's the other guy's name? I'm having Malcolm Roberts. You have George mm. Christensen. All these, there's a few group of these politicians. You've got Campbell Newman uh, that are all trying to do the right thing. And then they're just dragged yeah, through the mud. Um, they, and it's interesting. They actually are representing the people that they're supposed to be serving. But politics is self-serving and they're serving this globalist agenda. And that's unfortunately what we're faced with. And we have to survive in this world. And well, 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 oh, yeah, That's exactly right. I, I really think there's a political class that's completely disconnected with the actual people they're supposed to represent. And not only that, they have a globalist um, international mentality where they don't even they don't even like or they even hate the whole notion of the nation state and mm. uh, uh, and and they and they see the the very people they're supposed to be representing as either too uh stupid to uh unsophisticated uh unenlightened um to actually have a say in how things should go I mean, it's very much the, I, I always call them platonic philosopher king wannabes. Um, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they know best and everyone else is stupid enough. And if you dare say I have a problem with, I don't know, immigration or whatever, or you're xenophobic, you're racist, you're everything else. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we're seeing a pushback, uh, not just as, in Australia, but like internationally, I mean, most recently we've we had uh, Hungary and and Serbia just elected um, or re-elected uh, leaders that are very much of the populist nationalist um, uh, mm. movement. You have the upcoming French election. Le Pen is really within uh, winning distance of actually winning the election. Is actually the actual realistic possibility of that actually happening. Uh, the UK had Farage and, and, and Brexit and the uh, and the uh, UK Reform UK party kind of still nipping at the heels of, of the establishment, you know, and uh, there's Italy and there's, you know, they had the Italian uh, back in 2018, we had two, my, my background Italian, so yeah, I'll be following that, I'll be following that in depth. I mean, back in 2018, you had a coalition of the two most anti-establishment, anti-globalist parties actually become a coalition government in the Lega and the Five Star Movement. And now they basically talk about a political class giving the middle finger to the people. Now we have Draghi, which is the most pro-EU, pro-globalist you can get. Um, <laughs> So it really shows, um, yeah, yeah, um, a pushback is not just happening in Australia, but everywhere else. I mean, mm. for example, if you were, if you had to go overseas, if you had to relocate, if things got that bad, out of curiosity, where would you see yourself going? 
Um, yeah, I probably picked somewhere that on a foundational level had it a lot better than Australia. My, my worst fear would be moving from here and just going to the same type of place, just a different degree of degeneracy. So I would pick, I would pick somewhere um, that I think on a foundational level had it right. So maybe, maybe um, Florida uh -huh. under DeSantis. Uh, Texas, <clears throat> something like that. Um, you know, the, that's probably the realistic, tangible option. But places like Hungary um, and things like that are appealing on a political level in the fact that the WEF, the World Economic Forum, hate them <laughs> and yeah. they're in power. Um, Part, particular part of the world right now I don't really know if I want to be anywhere near as well well yeah um, for other reasons <laughs> yeah for other reasons um but <laughs> to be honest I'm I, I think America is probably a tangible option um maybe the UK maybe um they seem to um have it a little bit better and it it wouldn't be too much different to Australia, but I just think that um, the English might have it a little bit better than us. Um, but if I if I somehow invent a tree that grows money, I might just buy an I might just buy an island somewhere and create my own country, my own tax system, and a very strict border policy, right. and I might just exist there. Um, right. That would be the dream, but I, I, I just don't know. I, uh, so I don't see, I don't think that, don't see that happening. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> never it's a possibility. Say never. Yeah, never um, say never. Yeah, well, with um, with uh, keeping on what you said with Hungary and Serbia and all them, I, I think one of the reasons why the Economic Forum hates them as much as they do, and. Yeah, and even Russia, for that matter, is that I th there were I think they lived under a form of globalism, known you know known as communism for so long. Uh, they now are out of it, and they can recognize the writing on the wall. They've yeah. been I've been here before, you, you know. I can see what you're doing. I know what you're on about. We want nothing to do with you, and that's probably why they hate it as much as they as they are. I mean. Um, uh, uh, Russia, uh, if you look at that, they finally got off the feet after being basically pillaged uh, after the after the Cold War. They, they collapsed. the The West basically kept them destroyed with the uh, whole um, sh um, uh, shock doctrine economics. They finally got off their feet. They finally got, the, the, Russia, for example, wanted to be let in. They wanted to be Western uh, for a long time. But I think the West, ironically, has almost gone communist. And the Eastern Europe has actually gone more Western, you know, culturally. Uh, mm. <laughs> I mean, we had such a window of opportunity to basically be on the same page, finally. Uh, but uh, it's really strange how we almost are back, in, back into a Cold War situation and almost with the roles flipped. Very strange. Yeah, it's a big irony for sure <laughs> how it's all worked out. Um, yeah, we've so I think the West, the Western nations have certainly regressed over time and the and the nations that have come from a really um, I guess difficult sort of historical background have kind of come out of that. It's like that old saying, you know, hard times create good men, good mm. men create hard times. You know, we've had good times for a really long time. Now we've created weak men. They've come out of their hard times with strong men and are going into good times so it is like this cycle um that you can sort of see through different areas around the, the world and i think the west unfortunately we're going we're going to hit rock bottom for a little bit um before mm. we see good times again mm. 
Uh, okay, I think um, we're running out of time. Um, I was wondering if you, is there anything else you would like to uh, say or any other topic you'd like to cover? No, I just appreciate you having me on. It's It's been a good chat. It's been nice to catch up and um, it's always good to connect with like-minded people, um, especially, you know, in, in our own country and um, I appreciate having the opportunity to kind of elaborate on, on a few things past a couple of sentences on a tweet or a post. So I appreciate you having me on. Okay. Um, is there anywhere, you'd like to say, anywhere people can find you or connect with you online? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so all my writing things um, and a podcast that I uh, host for Cauldron Pool, you can find me on their website, C A L. D R O N and then pool.com. Um, all my, yeah, all my written articles are there. All my, I do a, the Cauldron Pool show where I interview people all around the world for different matters. All the links are on there. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Gab, um, Telegram. The accounts I'm most active on would be Twitter and probably Instagram, everything else. I kind of have, but don't really use, but yeah, I'm happy for people to follow along. Um, ask me any questions, interact and yeah, look forward to it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining me and I'll, um, hope to talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thanks again.